So when I was in genetic counseling school, um, there were no BRCA1 and 2 genes. There were breast cancer families that were being collected. DNA was being collected from these families that had multiple people with breast cancer and ovarian cancers. And I was part of that. I was assessing these families. We were looking for the strongest families where people were still alive in the family who had the cancer in order to be able to collect DNA and compare those DNA samples so that we could trace down where the gene was. So we contributed to some of the early studies in the beginning. And little by little, as the 90s went ahead into the late 90s, clinical testing was more of the norm with the evolution of the options available for patients, the testing became a lot more palatable to patients. So things evolved even more. Insurance companies started not only paying for genetic testing and making up guidelines, but they started paying for early screening, expensive screening, and basically in invasive preventive procedures. So for a many years, we didn't have too many options, especially with breast cancer. We would evaluate breast cancer family histories. We knew from the early studies that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are only responsible for about 30% of hereditary breast cancer. We define hereditary breast cancer as at least three or four breast cancers in a family that is on the same side of the family, that follows a particular pattern, that is typically early onset. So we can identify a family with what looks like an inherited breast cancer syndrome, but we can't always identify the gene. Um, as more genes became associated with breast cancer, more research studies looked into them, and it was pretty hard to find another gene that was as prominent as BRCA1 or BRCA2. And so this is our challenge now, is that um, BRCA1 and 2 are responsible for 30% of hereditary breast cancer. What do we do with the other group? Do we really know all of the genes? No, we don't, and it's going to be evolving over time, and new genes are going to be discovered. But what it looked like in the research was that every new gene was responsible for really only a tiny number of hereditary breast cancer families. So the pie wasn't able to, you know, if we drew a pie chart, it wasn't really able to include a big chunk for any other gene than BRCA1 and 2, so we have to really divide up that pie. Now, the brilliant thing about next generation sequencing is that we can do a test that involves screening for many genes at the same time. So in the beginning, we thought, okay, BRCA1 and 2, that's where, that's where the money is, that's where we're gonna look. If patient's negative, well, we don't really have anything to offer. As time went by, we decided, okay, well, this gene, maybe we should test, maybe we should test this gene. We knew a couple high-risk syndromes involving breast cancer. We would test a gene at a time, depending on exactly what was going on in the family. So it was, let's assess the family, what is the most likely gene to be involved? Now, we have the possibility of saying, well, we don't have a clear picture of what syndrome may be involved, but we have this test that is a one-shot approach. The Cancer Next panel, which includes really all the syndromes in cases where we've had people with multiple primary cancers that we really just say, okay, well, this could be breast-related genes, this could be colon-related genes, and so, you know, we, we've had those kinds of situations where we just can't put our finger on it. And it's really um, much better to be able to offer a patient all this testing together in one shot rather than say, okay, let's rule out this gene, then let's rule out that gene, call them back in each time. And, um, you know, and could be five to ten times that we have to call them in for additional gene testing because we weren't able to find it the first time or the second time or the third time. You know, it would just be a lot of options to us. We never had any options before. It was BRCA or bust. And now we have all these options. Unfortunately for cancer genetics in the field, 
um, another lab has trained a lot of nurses to just test for their genes that they test for. Um, and this is a little narrow. And, you know, and I think it leads to a lot of misconceptions by patients. They think that they've been tested for everything that they need to be tested for. So now that we know BRCA1 and 2 lead to breast and ovarian cancer, what about the other genes? Again, you know, part of the real beneficial um, opportunity that we have in offering clinical testing is that, you know, unfortunately research testing is not moving fast enough for us. So clinical testing is actually pushing us to find more associations. We still base our medical recommendations on what, what's been found in research, but exome sequencing and these next-gen panels are finding these genes that also have a predisposition for breast and ovarian cancer. Possibly some have only breast cancer risk, possibly some have only ovarian cancer risk, or both. So it's really changed the definition of the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome from just BRCA1 and 2, and we would tell people, well, you're negative, don't worry about your ovaries, to look at all these genes that have been found and that we can test for, and there is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer that is coming from other genes. So we learned a lot and um, it's changing what we know about the syndrome, how the syndrome presents in a family, and what we can do about it. So we found a couple of families. Um, one family in particular, which has been extremely exciting for us, was a young girl at the age of 28 and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, she came in with her family for genetic counseling. And when we took her family history, we saw that there were four pancreatic cancers in her family. And it was pretty devastating because these pancreatic cancers were all diagnosed in the 40s and 50s. And typically pancreatic cancer is a disease of the elderly. So having four individuals with pancreatic cancer all at young ages without any environmental risk factors like smoking really we started to think about the association of breast and pancreatic cancer. So we know a couple of syndromes. BRCA2 is very strongly associated, um, PALB2, um, you know, so we could have said, okay, let's test genes in succession. Um, and at that time, BRCA1 and 2 were not included in the panels, so we did rule that out. At the same time, we said, you know what, just in case it's negative, we took a sample and we sent it to Ambry and we said to them, hold on to it till we get BRCA results. This was prior to the Supreme Court decision. And then um, BRCA testing came back negative on this young lady and we said, let's run the panel. The panel came out with very interesting results. The panel came out showing a pathogenic mutation in the ATM gene. ATM is a condition that in a recessive form, when you inherit a gene mutation from each parent, causes a very severe condition called ataxia telangiectasia. And the history behind that is very interesting because in the early 2000s, they started identifying the families that had children with, a, with AT, with ataxia telangiectasia, the mothers had breast cancer more often than we would expect by chance. So at the moment we have this family and it's a very big challenge because we don't have a lot of data on ATM and pancreatic. We do have data on ATM and breast cancer risk. So we're able to counsel the patient. She's really considering her options at this point. We've consulted with radiation oncologists to determine whether radiation treatment is going to be necessary for her long-term survival or whether she can avoid this, either by having mastectomy, um, you know, or other kinds of treatment. And so that's extremely important. And this is how we bring in the specialists in the field, and this is what makes it so exciting. You know, it, it's just really incredible that we can actually bring this new information to doctors and use it immediately within their expertise and get a team approach going. Ambry grows and develops 
with a lot of um, intake from the community. And that's really important. We want a lab that's responsive to our needs and to our patients' needs. And so if you're able to develop with that, you know, it's very beneficial to us.